Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of At War, the podcast by the Conflict Law Center. Today, we're very happy to have with us Meher Ahmed. Meher is a journalist and a filmmaker who is based in New York City. As a documentary producer and director, she has made award-winning shows with Vice on HBO, CNN, BBC, Hulu, and Amazon Prime. As a reporter and writer, she has published on the New York Times, the California Sunday Magazine, and the Scientific American, among others. She has worked in dozens of countries and covered conflict zones, identity, technology, politics, and pop culture. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to start off by asking you just very broad questions uh, about your experience reporting in Pakistan um, and also the nature of doing journalism in a war zone or in conflict areas. So we have this image of the caricatural journalist who arrives in a zone of atrocity, points the microphone at someone, asking them if they've been raped and if they can speak English. So what do you think of those stereotypes? Have we moved past them? And how can we move past them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting when you think of that story that you mentioned, um, you know, have you been raped and can you speak English? Part of the reason I think that it comes off as so crass and transactional for a lot of people who hear that that's maybe how a journalist is trying to find a character for a story is because it can almost seem like um, casting. I used mm. this word recently on a call with someone who was also a journalist and they were like, ooh, that word makes me cringe. And I can understand why, but in a lot of ways, when you're writing a story, you're wanting to find the perfect character who encapsulates the aspects of your story that you want to portray. Right. And in searching for that perfect character, you can be as blunt as saying something like that, or you can be more nuanced in it. But in effect, what you're doing is the same thing, mm. is finding somebody who's gone through an experience that encapsulates a broader story. Sometimes that perfect person doesn't exist, which is the limits of real life versus like fictional stories. And that is why there's a lot of ethical questions that come into play because mm. sometimes people do um, in media, you know, in the history of journalists tend to exaggerate or make someone a little bit extra so they do fit all of the, yeah. you know, aspects of a story that they want to tell. Um, but that's essentially what you look for. And when you go out doing that for a story, whether it's conflict related or non-conflict related, you have um, or at least I do have an idea in my mind of this is the type of person, this is the type of profile that I'm looking for. Sometimes you meet the person first and then pitch the story, but other times there's a like ongoing issue, such as a conflict, mm. and an aspect of it that you want to cover needs to be uncovered in that way. Um, I do think people have kind of started to move past it, but it's an interesting effect, you know, for me working in media for about a decade at this point, which isn't like a lifetime, but it's also quite a quite a bit of time. Yeah. Um, people's digital literacy has like really increased. So I think there was a willingness to participate, especially in like documentaries and videos um, in the past where people were more excited by it. Whereas now, especially in the US, but all over the world really, and even here in Pakistan, people have access to videos on their phone. Mm -hmm. They have access to clips of videos on their phone and they're very suspicious of who you are and what you're trying to do with them. Right, um, yeah. As a journalist, who do you represent? What are your motives? That kind of thing. And so it's made um, you know, finding that kind of person a little bit more difficult. And I think that stereotype comes into play frequently because um, you know, the motivations of you trying to find a specific type of person are questioned like mm. frequently when you, when you go out in the world trying to find them. Yeah, and also because when you see these documentaries coming out and then afterwards it's always like, oh, turns out they didn't pay any of these people or they kind of like exploited their story and then took all of the proceeds and didn't pay back. Like, I feel like so many of those stories follow a lot of the documentaries that come out as well. Yeah, and it's a complicated, uh, it's a complicated path because ultimately you should never pay your sources if you're going right, to be, right. you know, a, a journalist following ethical guidelines. But it is it is a transactional thing, especially when you make, create documentaries for, um, for profit um, mm. and you're turning them around and selling them. Let's say you're a filmmaker and you're trying yeah. to sell a documentary. So there is, a, there is often a gray area, especially when it comes to covering documentary subjects who are in a more vulnerable position, for instance, refugees mm. or, you know, victims of abuse, um, you know, people who don't have as much power as the person who's coming from a place who's making that film. And that is a really difficult dynamic to navigate. And yeah. journalism is a field where you don't necessarily have to get a certificate or a degree to be able to participate. Mm. So there's no official training per se for a lot of people who go into this. And now anyone with a camera 
can yeah. also attempt to make it. So it's, yeah. it can be, it can be quite complicated and it makes for a difficult path when it comes to ethics and journalism. Yeah. I, and I wanted to ask how much social media has kind of impacted this yeah. because you used to have that concept of a war correspondent who would be like embedded within the armed forces and then they would kind of get shown whatever the armed forces wanted them to see. So even with the NATO bombing in Kosovo, you had the NATO Supreme Commander. I still can't believe they called him the Supreme Commander, <laughs> but he was saying, oh, you know, I'm going to leverage all of this. Like we're going to synergize the aid convoys being there with the like public attention we're going to get from that. So how much, it, how is that possible now, mm -hmm. given we have social media and given everyone has a camera? And do you think that you can have a state controlling the narrative that much? You can have one party to the conflict, let's say, controlling it that much. Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, so for the two years that I was in Pakistan, I was stringing with the New York Times mm -hmm. and the New York Times has a reputation in Pakistan for being a mouthpiece for American interests. Right. And yeah. so people would say that to me frequently. Now, did my editor ever encourage me to do that? No. Did his ev editor ever encourage him to do that? Not to my knowledge. So I never felt that coming from top down. But what does end up happening in a broader sense is the sort of access that American publications and journalists are granted. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, in the Iraq war and the war against ISIS, um, I, you know, spent some time with the Kurdish militias. Now, okay. why did I spend time with them? Mm. Because they extended an invitation to me and said, yes, right, come with right. us. And just by virtue of having that access, then I got a really one-sided coverage of the war, which was from the Kurdish perspective. And time and time again, American journalists have that same thing. It's the same thing happening in Ukraine right now, where mm. basically American media is given a lot of access because Ukrainians have a vested interest in the West yeah. seeing what they're wanting to see. Whereas on the flip side, if you're an American journalist and you ask to embed with the Russian military, yeah. they're not going to open, you know, let you come in with open arms and and take pictures of whatever you want. So the the bias kind of, especially in conflict zones, ends up um, appearing at just as a result of pure access issues. Social media makes it really interesting because obviously anyone can now post pictures, including members of the military. Yeah. Um, and I find that to be so fascinating, but it also makes it really difficult to ascertain truth from fiction. Like one of the things that I think um, is growing to be one of the more like in-demand positions in media is uh, the, the type of people who collect lots and lots of social media video to verify certain acts. So for instance, with Uyghurs in China, that like, you know, you're going to take lots of evidence and satellite imagery and lots of videos from different things and compile it. And, you know, a team of forensic researchers at the New York Times might take pictures of this, this and this and say, here's what we can confirm. Okay. Um, and I think that is the path forward because it is so difficult to tell when something appears in your, you know, stream as you're scrolling at this point to be able to verify, um, you know, where it's from, whether it's truth or fiction. And, you know, if you're looking at if what you're looking at is like truthful to a certain extent. Um, but on the other side of it, I do think that it kind of takes away that uh, the sort of dynamic between who gets to be the storyteller. So yeah. and I think that's a really great one, to be honest, because, for instance, you know, with with refugees and people who are living through conflict, they don't need to necessarily rely on um, someone flying in from London uh, to mm. give them an interview for their story to get heard to the world. And with that being the case, it makes it a lot easier to have like a lot of different voices from different walks of life yeah. um, accessible to all of us. And to me, that's a good thing. And it doesn't it's not a it's not something that um, is like actively harmful to journalists as a profession. It just means that there's more voices. Yeah, okay. I find the the Kurdish Peshmergas quite interesting because the the kind of glamorization and like valorization that was done of them, you're just like, okay, you see these like really beautiful Kurdish women holding these weapons and being like, these are the guys who are fighting ISIS. But then you see that also happening with the IDF. And so you're kind of like, oh, I don't know how much to, how much this is good content that we should be like, okay, this is, this is what we, you know, want coming out of it in a way. <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, it's good to have that skepticism, but it is, it's one of those things where it's like, I would say the Peshmerga know exactly what they're doing by having media come in like that yeah, and see, yeah. you know, women in that stance. 
they understand that it has um, a positive connotation in the West and that directly translates into mm. people recognizing them as a Kurdish state and yes, receiving yeah. more funds from American politicians who look as their cause is worthy. And mm. all of that sort of plays into, you know, um, the the sort of like media cycle and who gets access to what. And to me, it is really easy to just say, yes, we'll show what you're letting us show. There's yeah. a phrase dog and pony show. And okay. for a lot of military embeds, it's a dog and pony show. What does that mean? It means that when you, let's say, sign up to go to, um, you, let's say you embed with the American military in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They're not, they might say we're taking you to the worst part of the war and we're going to let you see it how it is. Mm -hmm. When how it is might be that they're understaffed, that their battalion may not have the expertise to deal with the war that they're dealing with. That's very embarrassing. So they take you on like a nice tour of okay. like the best part. And yeah. that happens in a lot of military embeds where um, the only way you can get access to the front line is through uh, access to a certain, you know, controlled aspect of the military. It makes sense. That's their protocol. But you mm -hmm. have to be extremely wary of what you're being shown at that point because um, like when someone says, let me be your guide instead of you can just, you know run loose and report on whatever you yeah, want, then yeah. you have to question why Why are these the things I'm being shown versus mm. anything else. Um, have you read No Good Men Among the Living? No, but I've heard it's great. Yeah, and because he actually learned all of the local languages and you could tell that like, he did just do the whole like going off and reporting these stories, which are really, really interesting. Um, how much do you think that has your ability to find those stories within Pakistan has to do with you being Pakistani? I think it's huge, and I think it's a massively overlooked um, aspect of finding for foreign correspondence for countries. Right. Okay. Um, you know, I'm not obviously the only Pakistani person who can write in English and speak mm -hmm. Urdu and other languages as well. Um, but it's a shame that there's not more foreign correspondents who are, you know, either dual nationals or people that hail from the countries that they're reporting yeah. on, because um, there is an aspect of that where I think, uh, you know, if, if a tour is being given and there's a dog and pony show being attended, mm -hmm. that you can understand the subtleties of languages. You don't need a translator yeah. to be able to, you know, pick up on um, maybe something I'm being shown isn't, isn't exactly what it seems. Because um, you used to have that, like, like the Pakistani character would be that you, you were... Wait, what are those bulletproof vests? <laughs> yeah, yeah, bulletproof vests. Yeah, and he would be wearing that on the top of Marriott and be <laughs> acting like he was in like a lot of danger. And you would just, you would not have that as a Pakistani journalist. Absolutely not. And I think it, in a way, it's one of those things where I think for us as viewers who are watching Western coverage of a country that we're familiar with, it's like painful almost to see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's even harder in a sense because... At the end of the day, I, I you know some of these decisions get made because there's an understanding that the the ideal viewer, which for American news channels is a like average American, i.e. white, mm -hmm. wouldn't relate to someone like me reporting on Pakistan as my home country. They want to see one of them oh, really? in their own in mm -hmm. the country as a host because then they're like, hey, I'm one of you. I'm here in this new land and let me explain to you how things right. okay. are. So there is that relatability aspect of it where I think um, that that does play into it. But this this uh, top of the hotel flak jack reporting mm -hmm. is like the bread and butter of American cable news. Okay. For everywhere, yeah. for everywhere, for Afghanistan, for Pakistan, for Nairobi, for a lot of these places where there's any sort of conflict and it's sort of um, like, it, it's one of those things where those types of journalists are really in a different league, I would say. Mm -hmm. They sort of act as like, new, like literal anchors, but news anchors that uh, then are given actual reporting from someone else and then they just regurgitate it to camera but okay. the effect of it then makes it look like you have to wear a flag jacket to stand on top of the roof of the marriott right anyone right no so that's not the case yeah, yeah yeah and the fact that they're kind of um so when in afghanistan especially it, they would just go from compound to compound to compound and you would it would be weird to go to these compounds because you would feel like you were in new york when you were in the middle of kabul and then you you think, well, how do they, they get out and talk to anyone? And secondly, everyone who they do speak to is so pro-American. So they would only 
interact with certain ethnicities. Mm-hmm. So they would interact with Tajiks and Uzbeks mm-hmm. and would never ever talk to Pashtuns. They would never ever go to Kandahar. So you're like, what kind of reporting are we getting? And it and the I feel like I've never trusted the media since 2016 <laughs> when they told me Brexit wouldn't happen mm-hmm. and Trump wouldn't get elected. <laughs> yeah. And I think from then I just started being on Twitter all the time to get news because you and it, but again the whole how how are you sure that this is real and how do you verify that? Because yeah. especially in Pakistan, you have so much misinformation, disinformation, yeah. and you have the whole what like WhatsApp culture of like yeah. even my dad sometimes I'll go home and I'd be like, Wait, what are you saying? Why do you think that this is the case? Um and I don't know if conventional media especially given all of the budget cuts and mm-hmm. given the fact that you you keep on seeing it kind of receding and not able to handle online versus print, all of that kind of stuff. So what is the future of the media in terms of like dealing with all of that stuff? So. Yeah, I mean, it's, I wish I had the answer. If I did, I would probably have a really high paying job right now. Um, <laughs> no, I think, uh, I think it's a hybrid, obviously. And there are a lot of things that are changing. I think a lot of newspapers and correspondents or newspapers that do international coverage that are Western based newspapers are understanding that a lot of their readership can come from the diaspora and from local readers if they were okay. to try and tap into that base. Um, whereas that was definitely not the case, um, you know, for the last like 20 or so years. Mm-hmm. It's like, we're covering this so that this group of people can read it. It is not yeah. for the local audience. And that's kind of why you see so much outrage when some foreign reporter flies in, parachutes in and writes like some stupid take that everyone on local Twitter is like, why did he write this? Yeah. How did this happen? And it's like, yeah, because the person who's reading it, who he thinks is reading it, is not you. It's someone mm-hmm. sitting in America, right. sitting in London. Right. Um, so I think that is starting to change because there are people with the kind of like flattening of access of information that social media brings mm-hmm. that um, more, more readers are more vocal about the fact that that's just like a silly way to cover the place that yeah. they live. I remember when the Bin Laden raid happened Mm -hmm. because I'm from Octobab and the reporting on that, I was like, this is so insane because I know the area. And they would have written, uh, there was one article I read because like journalists kind of just descended on the area and started writing about it where he was like, oh, uh, this town is so small that if you sell a donkey, everyone knows about it. And I was like, who is selling donkeys in Aftabad? I, do- I-, I was just like, has this guy been? Like, it doesn't make any sense to report on it like that. Um, yeah, and I, again, it goes back to the whole, like, you need Pakistanis doing it, because no Pakistan would have ever written that about Aftabad. Well, the other thing, too, is that as someone who's both, like, covered a country that I know really well, such as Pakistan, but then also gone to other countries that yeah. I don't know as well. I've been in the position of somebody who's had to come up with a thesis statement and an overall take that like for a place that I, you know, I'm just getting familiar with right. on my feet. So it's really good to understand the um like problems that you see as like for me when I think of myself as a Pakistani and I look at people writing incorrect or misleading stuff about the way that Pakistan is, then when I go to a different country, I listen to the person that I'm working with locally that much more. Mm -hmm. And that isn't always the case. Like, there's a lot of, you know, foreign media and producers that I've worked with that are like, I'm here to accomplish this story. And if someone's like, that story doesn't exist. This happens all the time. Right. Like, no, 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 it's not like that, actually. Mm -hmm. But they're like, well, I got my budget approved to tell this story, so I'm going to push it through and try to make it happen no matter what and find the one person who had something really bad happen to them and put the whole story around it. And that is a really terrible dynamic. Um, It's so lazy. It's... It isn't just lazy, it's actually really hard because then when you're trying to find the one person, you're like, right. it's not a real story. And so that that makes it a lot harder, mm-hmm. I think, to be able to accomplish it. But um, I'm by no means saying I'm perfect in this and, and you know, having worked in like 22 odd countries at this point, like I'm sure down the line I've made a misgeneralization about a country that I've reported on. But the best thing to do in my experience has been listen to the local person and that, to me, makes your reporting, like, ten times better as it is. Yeah. To disregard what they have to say is, like, a really kind of... It doesn't serve anybody, in my opinion. Um, but, unfortunately, that's not, like, the standard. That's not, that's not like, a, a widespread belief in a lot of different dynamics for foreign coverage. Mm. 
Yeah, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the stuff that you've done on Pakistan for the New York Times. So I was reading somewhere, you, you've written about almost everything which is to do with Pakistan. So polio vaccines, building dams, extrajudicial killings. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, uh, and I think that you're currently working on this, which is uh, the TTP. So the resurgence of the TTP, how that's happened, mm -hmm. how we've allowed it to happen, and uh, like what juncture we're at with them. Yeah, it's a very complicated question, <laughs> but I think, you know, we're, we're a couple of weeks out after the attack in Peshawar where yeah. 100, more than 100 police officers were killed, a couple of weeks out from an attack on a police station in Karachi and a main street in Karachi. So I think it's safe to say that we're, we're at a point where majority of the people in the security system are kind of at high alert mm -hmm. if something so brazen as those two attacks has happened in such short succession. Um, it's interesting because I came here like six months after Kabul fell um, to work on a podcast that was about the 1993 World Trade Center bomber. Okay. So it was a lot of like historical, like, you know, talking to people who had their jobs in the 90s in the security field um, or, you know, speaking to people who knew of that time. And although it wasn't the topic of the podcast, all of them, this is like, you know, basically a year ago, were saying to me, we are preparing for the blowback to come to us. Okay. There was a clear understanding all the way from police, you know, through military intelligence that like this Afghanistan becoming Taliban controlled will no doubt have an effect on Pakistan's security situation. Right, right. Um, the pity of it is, is that that was a full year ago. And I think between the political kind of like sideshow that is our <laughs> political system, that there was so much focus and attention on other issues yeah. that this was allowed to fester and turn into something really, really dangerous without getting the adequate attention. When I think anyone who lived along the border of Afghanistan, who lived in tribal areas like Bani and Waziristan, could have told you that this was going to get worse. They were living that reality, right. you know, a year ago, two years ago. But, you know, when things happen in tribal areas, people sitting in Lahore and sometimes Karachi and Islamabad aren't necessarily paying attention to yeah. it. Um, so I think we're at a really important juncture because uh, there is a possibility to get to a place where things can get um, much, much worse. Mm -hmm. But we're also at a place where, you know, there have been a good chunk of years of relative peace here. Yeah. And I think that the kind of military and powers that be have an understanding of how, what it took to accomplish that back right. then. And things are different because back then Afghanistan was not fully Taliban controlled. Mm. But I think, you know, it, it doesn't mean that all hope is lost. Mm. Um, do I think that it's going to be extremely difficult? Yes, because I think uh, people are very tired yeah. and the economy is really not at a place to be able to afford full-fledged operations the way that, you know, this country had in 2015, 2016. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but it's something to keep an eye on, and I hope that more people in the country in urban centers pay attention to it, because I think the past year, the lack of attention is really what got us here in the first place. Yeah, I feel like we're doing that again, though, because even you had over 100 people die in Peshawar, and I feel like very few people were actually talking about it. And even when you had the the TTP talks failing last year, I think it was last year, and I, I couldn't get over that their, what they wanted was the demerging of Fatah and KP. And I don't know why, I don't understand why. Is it just because they didn't want state control over those areas? That's correct, um, yeah. And it was like, and I think it was correctly the hill that we died on in the sense that we were like, no, that's not happening. Like, we have to merge this with KP. Um, and then since then, the ceasefire ended and then you had the TTP being like, OK, no holes barred, we're going to do whatever. And like you said, I'm just like, where the first world money lenders are at our throat, people are wondering how they're going to make their 
uh, their paychecks. The w- woman who does my beauty salon, she spent 45 minutes yesterday just telling me, get out of this country. Mm. And she was just like, everyone I know, all of my clients are mm. leaving. And so I feel like there's so, m- like you said, the political stuff, circus, and then you have the economy being so bad. Is there a political will? And do you think that there is a military solution? Because part of me wants to be like, There is such little to be gained from military solutions. So yeah. maybe talks are the best way to go about yeah. it. But I mean, we have already tried that. There is there is one thing that is significantly different with this go around, which is that the people who live in the areas that were formerly Fatah have a much stronger and open resolve against the TTP. Whereas okay. I think in 2011, 2012 you know, all the way through the drone war, that there was a little bit more sympathy with this group, that, like, maybe, you know, they can give us something that we don't have currently. Oh, really? Okay. In speaking with activists and people who are from that region and journalists from that region, you know, in these last few weeks, they have said there is, an, like, stronger, you know, an open discontent with them. Okay. So there have been massive sit-ins in, you know, towns in Waziristan. There have been marches. We don't see coverage of that in the mm. mainstream. And that's a shame because I think that that group of people is really the answer to this problem. Okay. Um, is giving, you know, progressive voices in the tribal areas the ability to resolve this with the tools that they have at their means. Because mm-hmm. I think the hardest part of this history has just been seeing Pashtun parts of Afghanistan and Pakistan really paying the price culturally, mm-hmm. you know, a way of life yeah. that existed prior to a war existing in this place. And people are really fed up. And I don't think that anyone's like, yeah, come to my backyard and bomb these guys. Yeah. I think they're like, I just want them gone. Okay. And for them to be gone, frankly, is not very difficult. It doesn't necessarily involve like a full scale invasion. In my opinion, I think there's a lot of ways in which There can be people, you know, jailed. There has to be more of a will, I think, from, Mm -hmm. you know, the government and the state in Pakistan to really see these people as once and for all for criminals. To me, it's beyond the pale. I think after Mm APS, sitting at a negotiating table with them is like unacceptable. Okay. So I find that 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 they kind of have run out of chances. And yeah, it's point in case the Peshawar bombing it's yeah, like you yeah. know that's that's the only way that they know how to um, show their power so if you don't want average Pakistanis to pay the price we kind of have to nip it in the bud before okay. it turns into a widespread issue okay okay that's interesting for me to hear <laughs> okay my last question is just about uh, editorial oversight because I did want to ask you how you work With that, I think we've mentioned a little bit about mm-hmm. what happens at the New York Times and the other um, organizations that you've been affiliated with, but also in terms of government censorship, how mm-hmm. does that work? I remember there was a period of time where every time I would get the, so the Express Tribune has the um, it, the New York Times, this international edition, and I would keep on opening it and there would be like empty pages <laughs> and it would be like our Pakistan office has deemed this unsuitable, so we've gotten rid of it um and there was a quote that i heard on bill maher but i'm sure it's from somewhere else and i'm sure he didn't come up with it <laughs> about how journalists are meant to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable how how possible do you think that is under a kind of in a state where you're being so heavily scrutinized and perhaps censored by the government and covering topics like the ttp Yeah, so um, in moments like that, I'm very thankful that I, you know, when I was working here, that I was working for American publications where I could get, like, the true story out. Mm-hmm. I think point in cases, uh, I covered the first year, basically, of um, the Pashtun Tafis movement, the PTM, okay. yeah. and covered it all the way from when um, Nikib Masood was first killed by a police officer in Karachi all the way through to when they had huge marches and then were being, you know, shut down. So in that way, for me, I never felt like I can't write down my truth. I feel so deeply for journalists who are, you know, writing locally because that is not necessarily the case. And I think that is, that is so apparent when you open a paper like Donner Express, because when I first moved here, I was like, let me read the paper and familiarize myself with yeah. the day's events. And you, you'll read a, I would read a paragraph and say, I honestly have no idea what I just read. 
Right. Because right, it's right. all yeah. innuendos and subtleties yes, that you can yeah. only understand after being here for some time. It, it has taken me so long, actually. And that's probably because, you know, I'm just slow to grasp these things. <laughs> but there were so many things that you were like, oh, everyone is talking about this. It is on Twitter, like trending. And it has been for a week. No sign of it in the paper. Like not at all. Um, yeah. And I think yeah. that's honestly, it's been a huge problem for... Um, for for the government to figure out how to censor things because in the past you could just go up to an editor and say don't run this okay and yeah. they would be they'd run a blank thing mm. but you can't go to twitter and say don't run this twitter doesn't yeah. care yeah so there's been ways to then circumvent that which is finding the individuals who are putting that sort of information out and threatening them specifically. Right, right, so that right. happens. But I think when you're in a field where you have an understanding that, you know, the truth is not being told in the like paper that you're reading, mm -hmm. that it also makes it incredibly hard to ever like feasibly convince someone that like, no, I'm, I saw it with my own eyes and I'm telling oh, you the right. truth. Okay, so okay. Push in the Hoppers movement is a good example because mm. I think a lot of people, because I work for New York Times, were like, well, you're just an American okay. stooge. <laughs> and you're like, okay, yeah. sure. But like, I'm trying to tell you that I saw this because there's no trust anywhere. If you open the paper right. and you're yes. like, I don't, I'm not seeing what I'm seeing in real life, yeah. then you don't yeah. have trust in that paper anymore. Mm. And to me that erodes trust in all institutions. And it makes it really difficult in a place like Pakistan to separate fact from fiction because there is no trusted source where I'm going to say I have faith or 90% faith or there's like an ethical process where I trust that what I'm reading is yeah. factually correct. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why so much news is kind of told by people anecdotally. Whereas I feel like in the West, you have a lot less of that of like, I've heard this and so it must be true. Whereas here it's like, oh no, I trust this person. So I trust whatever they're saying, regardless of what it is. It's, I think it's true for a lot of countries that have this sort of um, deep state paranoia. Like yeah. e Egypt, I read a lot of literature and, you know, stories that come out of Egypt. And it, it's a really like kindred country to Pakistan to me because I think they've yeah. had very similar governments and a lot of Egyptians lead their daily life. There's a lot of um, dark humor and sarcasm right. and okay. a sort of fatalism that yeah. comes with living your life that way because you're like, well, you know who is, you know, responsible and yeah. just suggestion, suggestion, wink, wink. And you're like, I, nothing is under my control and nothing what I see is real. And when, hmm. when that's something that you absorb, on a daily basis as like a population, I yeah. think it really makes it difficult to bring people back into a democratic space. Yeah, it really like seeps into who you are and your personality. Absolutely. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, regardless of like what you do and what your profession is too. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. I think this was such an interesting discussion. Um, thank you to everyone at home who's followed this and we hope you tune in for future episodes.